Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be speaking with Fruitvale Mayor Steve Morset. The town of Fruitvale embodies small town charm with scenic beauty. With a population of approximately 2,000 residents, Fruitvale boasts a tight-knit community atmosphere where neighbors know each other by name. Surrounded by forests and majestic mountains, outdoor enthusiasts thrive with endless opportunities from hiking, skiing, and yes, even fishing. The village center features quaint shops, local eateries, and historic landmarks offering a glimpse into its rich heritage. Known for its welcoming spirit and serene surroundings, Fruitvale provides a peaceful retreat for both residents and visitors seeking solace in nature's embrace. So stay tuned and we will be right back after a quick break with cross-border interviews with Mayor Steve Morset. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Steve, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. I want to start by getting to know the persona behind the mayor's chair of Fruitvale. And I want to start by asking you the same question I ask every single municipal leader who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception to this question. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I'd have to say that came from my parents. My parents were both heavily involved in the community and uh my dad was on several boards and uh just a volunteer general all-around volunteer in the community and and so was my mother so i uh, that was instilled in me so i just carried on that was that was what we do <laughs> so from the records i can find and correct me if i'm wrong the very first election that you put your name forward is in 2014 and you run for councillor and this is the first time yep. you, you go out and you run for council what was going on in 2014 that said steve okay it's time to put up or shut up and time to put my name on the ballot to try and give back to my community at the council table well you know what it had always it had always run through my mind that I'd like to do. I had always been involved with my kids' sports. Uh, we have four boys, and they all played hockey. And I was always involved in their sports, whether coaching or manager or president of the club or whatever. And uh, it was it was in the back of my mind that I would maybe do something a little a little more with the community. And um, I had. I retired early and I had just retired early that year in 2014. Actually, I hadn't quite retired. I was almost there. And, uh, and uh, the, the previous mayor, she called me about three days before the deadline to register and said, somebody mentioned your name to me and uh, wondered if you're interested in running for council. And I said, well, I have thought about it, but I hadn't specifically about this election. And uh, I said, give me a day or so. And she said, well, you only have three days. <laughs> and so uh, so I thought about it and uh, I thought, yeah, no better time than the present. And uh, I, I, I now have the time and I'll give it a go. Had you been an observer of municipal politics prior to 2014 or like many people who I've spoken to across Canada, it wasn't until someone actually asked you that you thought, okay, maybe municipal politics is where I would want to potentially start my political career at. Yeah. Um, like, did you know what was going on in the community? 
you know, somewhat. I always, I always kept abreast of what was going on in in Fruitvale and the greater community, which is Montrose, Trail, Rossland. I always kept abreast of what was happening, uh, not closely, like you know, I didn't make a point of it, but I always read up on it and kept abreast. And uh, and I, my career was in the school district, and I was director of operations in the school district. And some people had asked me, well, when you retire, would you run for a school trustee? But it was, I didn't like the way they operated and I didn't really want to get back involved. It was more like going back to work if I did that. So so uh, that, that's why I chose to go to uh, municipal politics. And that's, that's what brought me there. So I, I've got to ask because being an outsider and then actually going in and actually making those decisions is kind of a wake up call for a lot of people for you. What was, what has been the biggest eye opening experience? And I, and I know we're talking about a pretty big span here from 2014 to 2018, you are a counselor 2018, yeah. you run for mayor, you're elected 2022, you run for mayor again, but you're acclaimed. So you don't have to run an election. Yeah. What's been the biggest sort of eye-opening experience from your perspective on being on a village council for of your community? Well, you know, uh, is there's so many pieces. There's so many pieces you have to you have to deal with and work with, and um, it, it's not just a straight linear progression of this is what we're going to do and focus on this because, because things pop up all the time. And uh, so you set goals and you set a strategic plan and you uh, generally work towards that, but there's other things that, that pop up that aren't a priority when you set the strategic plan, but they force their way into the priority list. And, uh, and, and the other thing is, you know, I when I got in, I thought I'm gonna get in there, and we're gonna we're gonna do some things, and and fortunately we have, but it's taken a lot longer than I anticipated. You know, um, it's always really, fun to watch the sausage being made in some sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, for go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know what, back right from the first day started, we were talking about um, uh, some projects in Fruitvale. And a couple of years in, we we purchased a derelict school and the property that it was on to do some housing and so on. And I thought, you know, yeah, five, six years, we'll be moving right along. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it took five, six years to get the first project on that property going and uh I'll tell you that's a that's a daycare that we did on that property and we just completed it at the end of 2023 and um it was so rewarding after all that time all those meetings all those all the lobbying everything to to actually see and feel and touch something that you've been working towards and now right directly behind that piece is an affordable housing complex that's in the ground being built as we speak. But those things took six to seven years to get to this point. I can imagine your community has grown somewhat over the last few years that you've been on council. Now we did have COVID-19, which put a wrench into that. How do you ensure that what you're doing to grow your community benefits the majority of the people of your community because i we always look at the greater good on this show we always look about how do you make your community grow as a whole and not leave people behind in your time as mayor have you found that balance to be able to grow your community in a sustainable way that it's not being done on the backs of people who are potentially struggling, particularly now with this sort of inflationary period that we're in in Canada? Yeah, that is a real struggle that we've always got forefront in our mind because prices are escalating so much for people and including for the for the village and uh so it's a real struggle of course we'd like to keep the tax increases at zero everybody wants that 
but it's just not possible. Uh, you know, we, over over my years on council, we've tried some things. We tried to um, we tried to do some things to save taxpayers money. We we amended our snow clearing policy, and we got caught a couple times where there was we didn't have enough people out removing snow, and uh, and uh, so while it saved us. Uh, a significant amount of money the couple of years we did it, it just wasn't serving people and people were not happy. So although everybody wants their taxes not to increase, people want the service. And it's it's really it's a really difficult balance there to to uh match people's uh needs and wants for service to tax increases. And um yeah, and another example, we we kind of, we let uh, maintenance slide in our cemetery and we just kind of did the, the the necessary things, watering and mowing the grass and so on. Pretty soon we're getting complaints about uneven ground and so on. And so you have to provide the services. And I, I'm getting to the point now where, yeah, we're trying to be as fiscally responsible as as everybody as every municipality is, I think. But we have to maintain the pipes in the ground, our roads, our parks. It's just uh, it's a requirement of the job. It's what we have to do. I, I, does the average person in your community understand? the challenges that the community is facing because I have noticed, and this is me speaking right now for those who are yeah. listening in your community yeah. or outside, this is me yeah. speaking. Um, the average person I would say doesn't really care what's going on at village hall, at the town hall, at the city hall, at the town center, oh. as long as their garbage is picked up and their water's turned on, that's all that they care about yeah. at the end of the day. And I'm assuming yeah. you've heard that's that. Right. Oh Yeah. How do you ensure that you are doing what you need to do and make sure those infrastructure projects get done when we see an apathy when it comes to municipal politics in some sense? Or are you getting the engagement that you would want in your community to ensure that the things that you're voting on, the things you're moving forward on when it comes to budget, when it comes to service levels, are the things that the people of your community want. Is there an apathy that you're seeing or is your community sort of a sort of a golden uh, circle here where people actually are willing to give you their opinion? You know what? It, it's a small community and um, I find that it's really hard for us to get our message out. The best messaging the best messaging I have, unfortunately, it is a small community, is when I walk my dog. <laughs> I, a, a dog walk that should take half hour takes me an hour and a half because I run into this person and that person, and that's fine. And it's and I'm able to get the message out one person at a time, and then hopefully they spread that around their circle. And uh, because it it's really tough. Like we 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 have a village newsletter. It's online, and and we have and we have a website, and and we try to get the message out as best we can. And we've been doing that. Like I I mentioned the daycare, and and uh, we've been doing that for years, saying we're working towards this. And when the when the excavator comes and starts working there, people ask me what's going on there. You know, <laughs> we've been we've been putting it out there for years, but so yeah, it seems like the the best is just talking to people in a small town. I I can't imagine what people do in a in a city. Like I don't I don't know how the message gets out because most of the people most people um I feel as long as they can flush your toilet and they have water, they're not too concerned about municipal politics and about the pipes and the roads unless they have to drive over a pothole every day you bring up a good point and as a former communications person for a municipality i i i agree with you whole 100 percent. you can communicate till you're blue in the face you can put it on everything yeah. websites newsletters but there's always going to be that one person i didn't hear about it so <laughs> while it's great that you can go out and actually 
walk your dog and talk to people. I can imagine the family life probably is a little bit hard <laughs> on that as well, because your yeah. partner or your wife or your kids are going, uh, I don't want to go with dad because this is going to be an hour long <laughs> conversation just to walk the dog for 15 minutes. Yeah. Have you found the balance? Because in the small town, you don't go to Victoria to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You are in your community. So when you go grocery shopping, people know who you are and will stop oh, yeah. you. Yeah. Have you found the balance to be able to say, okay, I'm the mayor today and I'm going to be out in the public. So I'm going to have to be it. But there's days that I just want to be Steve. I just want to be Steve and I just want to be able to relax. Or it seems like you're comfortable with merging those two and being the mayor 24 seven whenever you walk outside your house. Well, you know what? In a small town, you are. There's no, there's no getting away from it. When you, when there's you're no out, hiding in your community is what I'm here. <laughs> no hiding. When you're out in, in public, you're the mayor and uh, that's the way it is. But how I balance it is um, I'm an outdoor enthusiast. So I go out in the mountains skiing like, a, and not to the ski hill. I go out in the bush and I back country ski, cross country ski away from people. And that's where I get my, um, solitude and where I can recharge my brain and energy and and I cycle in the summer and uh, cycle and paddleboard and which are pretty solitary uh, sports so that's where I that's where I get my balance. So when people do approach you and do want to talk about the issue do they talk about the municipal issues or are you seeing a blurring of jurisdictional lines? Because you know, as mayor, you have a responsibility that you have to adhere to. You have pipes, you have sewage, you have wastewater, you have water. But since COVID-19, I've seen a blurring of that line to say mayors are now dealing with issues that they weren't traditionally dealing with 10, 15, 20 years ago, whether it be mental health, whether it be addictions, whether it be healthcare, education. Are you getting those questions that are outside your jurisdiction purview? And if you do get them, how do you say to that to that resident or that person who has an issue, it's not my responsibility, go talk to your MLA without sounding like you're passing the buck? Yeah, you know what, I, I, when people bring things up that are outside my jurisdiction, I'll, I'll listen and, um, and give my thoughts and, and tell them that, you know, it's, it's beyond what little old Fruitvale's responsibility is. And um, exactly, you know, you have to talk to our MLA, Katrina Conroy, or, or whoever it may be, you know, but um Absolutely, I listen and I'll give my thoughts and uh, and uh, it's just a friendly conversation, really. But and but yeah, you know what? And yeah, you know, in in my time on council, things have blurred a lot, and uh, you know, with with like you mentioned, healthcare and housing and and daycare. You know, it's really not. It's really not uh, council's responsibility to to do affordable housing or daycare, but it's important if if we can see the value to the community, we'll help where we can, you know. So so that's that's why we got into affordable housing, and um, we've got in in our area and in Fruitvale, we've got thirty percent of our of our population is seniors. And uh, most of them are in large single family homes and they have nowhere to downsize. So, so that's, that it was a driver for me to look at an affordable housing complex, a place that people could sell their home, move into a, a nice apartment and open up their home first for uh, young families. And uh, we need more of that because 30% seniors and growing. We, we have often talked on this show and not with you, but with other mayors yeah. that housing is not just a responsibility of the uh, housing is not a responsibility of just the municipality, the province, the federal government and the yeah. municipality have to come to the table. But 
they all have to come to the table. And the one thing that also needs to happen is developers need to come and knock on your door as the municipality and say, we want to build here. You can incentivize them, but developers actually have to come and door knock. Are developers coming to your community and saying, we want to build those affordable housings? Or are you having to look outside of the traditional realms of private developers and look at how we can build those affordable housing units that you are building, as you've just talked about, in our community to let those seniors downsize if they wish? Yeah, well, well, the, the approach we've taken is that I mentioned we bought the the derelict school with the the property. It's right in the center of town, beside the parks. Close, nice, easy walk to town to the elementary school and so on. And so our approach was to um, there was daycare money out there. The province was promoting daycares, so we said let's put a daycare on that property. It'll be a great anchor for the property. And, and we did a daycare survey and we're identified as a, as a daycare desert. There is no, there is no daycare in, in our community other than Ma and Pa doing it in their home. So, so we said, let's, if we can get the money from the province, we'll build a daycare. So we did. We, we, we approached a nonprofit uh, society to run it. So the village owns the daycare now. Nonprofit society runs it. It's a win-win. It, it doesn't cost us anything, and we've got 37-seat daycare. Uh, the affordable housing came from, like, like I said, years of building relationships, and I can't highlight that enough. Building relationships with other levels of government, uh, our neighboring municipalities, nonprofit societies when you build relationships with them you can make things happen and uh we had a good relationship with the lower columbia affordable housing society who has done some other projects in our area and and uh we reached out to them and said hey would you like to do a project on our property yeah let's talk about it so so we uh so we did, and we, uh, so what What we came to is we leased them the property for 60 years, the piece they needed, for a nominal sum, a dollar, two dollars, whatever it is, and uh, and we give them a, a tax relief for seven years once it's built and open, and uh, they're, oper they're the operators, wow. and... Uh, they're building it and operating it. And so they, they've they done that, not themselves. They're in partnership with BC Housing, uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing, and so on. And uh, it's being built as we speak. And that'll be 31 units, all accessible. Um, so it'll be one third will be deep subsidy for like pe pensioners that just have Canada pension, that type of thing. A uh, portion of it will be partial subsidy for people that work at lower paying jobs. And a portion of it will be market rental. Wow. It seems like you it seems like the community is being innovative in a time when you need to be as innovative as possible because. It is, it, and, 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 not, and I don't mean disrespect when I ask this question, Mayor, and please don't, Steve, please don't think that I am. A small town, small village like yours of roughly about 2,000 people, it seems like you guys are getting things done. And I'm not trying to be rude when I ask this, yeah. but how are you getting this done, particularly in this time? Because other municipalities across Canada would be going, we would love to build that daycare. We would love to build affordable housing so quickly and have sort of a diverse cross-section of affordable housing. Yep. How do you get this done? How is you? How are you and your council working together to ensure that you deliver on these big things that your community is needing? Well, you know what? It's there, There's a couple couple pe key pieces to it and i've mentioned already relationships you got to you have to build positive relationships with everybody that you come in contact with um because you're going to go to them for help sometime and so um 
so that to me that's number one key is building the relationships and um building a plan if you just have if you just have uh, a wide open well we'd like to do this and but we don't know how we're going to get there and nobody can step up and help you so you have to build a plan and and for that piece of property use that as example we we the first thing we did is build a master plan for it and we uh we applied for and got a grant to do that so it didn't cost the village any money and we got a professional to to uh build us a plan and with, with community consultation we had a we had a meeting in our hall at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning for half a day and we had 80 people come out and we were just flabbergasted. It was just fantastic. I'm flabbergasted and, we, and I've, I've done 200 of these episodes with municipal <laughs> leaders. 80 people is huge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we got great input on what people would like to see on that property. And, uh, and we built the, the plan. So, the daycare, the affordable housing are in phase one of the plan. Then there's phase two and phase three behind that because it's a 3.7 hectare property. And and so as I was alluding to before, we got the daycare, the affordable housing going on it. Now this the next phase will be some more housing, but that we want to be more private developer come in and uh, and do that. And because I believe because of the success we've had so far, we're now getting developers knocking on the door. And uh, we weren't before, like little old Fruvale, you know, people were not interested, developers, but we've had developers from Kelowna and other places come looking at the property. And and uh, so we're... Uh, yeah, I'm confident we'll we'll move ahead. Um, before we talk about the community as a whole, and I feel like we're already doing that, but before we turn to yeah. that section where I ask you some of the challenges and accomplishments of your community, I have one question that I want to talk about. And I think it's the important one that we I forget to talk about a lot on this show. I, you know, and I know that you are not going to please a hundred percent of the people in your community with every single thing you do at town hall. It's just, it comes with the game with politics. It is never going to happen. I don't care where you are. It's never going to happen. Is it important for you as mayor of your community to listen to all sides of the equation, those who dis disagree with you and those who agree with you? And not just be in an echo chamber of listening to the people closest to you and surrounded by you. And I say this, and I want to preface it by saying, listen to the people who oppose you, but they have to oppose you respectfully. As long as they're not calling you names, they're not de degrading you, I think you have the right to voice your opinion or opposition to something. How important is it to you for you to listen to all sides of the equation and not just the ones that agree with you? That's absolutely of utmost importance because, you know, whether your community is 2,000 or 200,000, you're going to have a multitude of different views and you can't, you can't ever, you're wrong if you ever think that you're right all the time. <laughs> you're, you're wrong because you're not and so you have to listen you you have to listen to everybody and even even like you may think gee this is outlandish like i i really don't want to waste time listening to this you have to you have to listen because um people have a right to to get their opinion out and um I'm, we're very fortunate this this time that we have a we have diverse views on council, bring, bringing those different views to council, which is perfect for council. It's the way it should be. It's, um, yeah, you bring all the different perspectives and you come to a respectful decision. And uh, fortunately, this council is really respectful of each other and we bring different views and we hash it out and we leave friends, you know, we leave amicably. And, um, it's so important. And, and I think people at 
I think it's wrong to not listen to somebody because you you think their their views are out there or whatever. They have a view and, and they deserve to be heard. I, and I agree wholeheartedly. I just, I always preface yeah. it by saying respectfully, because that is the key word in that statement. Absolutely. They have to be respectful. We won't yeah. accept disrespect. No. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, I want to turn to the uh, the community as a whole now. And before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it as I always do on this show, that this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council, but I'm assuming you've heard this rant a few times already. If you've listened to the show, yeah. this is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. The mayor is one vote on the council and he has to make up the council as a whole votes on issues and the majority, the, the majority in the vote wins. So, I've got to ask a question. In your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest challenge facing Fruitvale today as of recording this or issues? You can say more than one if you wish. Our biggest issue right now, like a multitude of municipalities across Canada, is, is infrastructure is is pipes in the ground roads uh they're so so expensive now and um keeping our taxes at a rate that people can afford to pay them and get that work done is a uh, is a huge huge challenge and can i ask a question on that yeah, I'm, I'm going to sort of poke the proverbial bear here for a second. You're right. Infrastructure is one of the key things that I've been hearing about a lot across this yeah. country. But if you don't fix it now, it's going to be more expensive next year. If you don't do it now, there could be issues this year. Are you finding that when you're looking at the infrastructure projects that you have that you need to fix or need to upgrade or need to do, you're potentially offsetting them by saying, okay, we have to do this, but we can't do it this year. So we have to do it next year. Are you putting things off because of the cost of uh, services, cost of construction, cost of these projects are just unreasonable right now? Absolutely, we're not doing all the work we would like to do. And it's, and really, it's because, it's because in order to, to do everything we would like to do on our infrastructure, we'd have to skyrocket our taxes. That's the bottom line. The money, the money's there if you have the political will to, to raise the taxes that much, but we just can't, you know, we just can't put all that on the backs of people all at once. So it has to be staged and, 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 and we're really well along the way of building a plan and, a, you know, a 10 year plan of where we're going with, with replacing infrastructure. And, and we're trying to do it in a way that, is the most sustainable economical way possible. And that is, okay, we need to do this block, but when we do it, we're replacing the water pipes, the sewer pipes, so that it's all done at once. We're not doing it twice. And, uh, and that's a great way of doing it, but it means you're not doing a lot of roads. You know, you're you're doing one right, but it's not a very big portion of the village's in infrastructure. You you mentioned the one thing that I hear a lot when I speak to when I speak to residents of municipalities that I come and visit, and that is the famous pothole word. Now. <laughs> You and I both know that municipalities do not have an endless supply of money as much as people think they may. You don't, and you cannot run deficits. So therefore, you have to balance every year. Infrastructure is one of the big things that people can see. People can put a tangible yep. uh, emotion to it and say, this road has been fixed. I see my tax dollars at work. Now, the average person, though, might say, well, that pothole is was bad, but the pothole in front of my house is worse. 
How do you explain to people that that pothole will be fixed in a timely fashion, but the pothole in front of John's house or the pothole in front of Sarah's house is much worse because everyone believes that their issue, whether it be a new park upgrade, whether it be more sidewalks in my area of the village, is the most important issue to them. How do you balance the needs of the community against the needs of the one? Well, you know what? I the, the best way we've found to deal with that is to put together a plan so that, you know, it, we right now we, we're in really good shape that we've got a fantastic public works foreman and we go to him and, 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 uh, and we've done all the engineering as well. So we know which pipes are worst. We know which roads are the worst. So we build a plan out 10 years of this is what we're going to be doing. And when somebody starts complaining about their road, we say, here it is. Yeah. Your road's bad. I appreciate that, but this is worse. We've got all the data to inform us that this one's getting done next year. Yours is six years down the road. That's sorry, but that's the way it is. <laughs> you know, are people willing to, uh, are people willing to accept that as sort of the realities that you live in? Because you're right. Every municipality probably has a great asset management plan where they look for 10, 15 years down the line. But the resident, they don't know what an asset management plan is. And they're going, well, John Street is good, but mine's worse. So let's do with mine. Yeah. When you actually have that truthful conversation to say, unfortunately, yours will get done, but just not this year, because there are other priorities that we as a municipality have looked at and realized that these areas are worse off and we need to get to them sooner than your potential area. Absolutely. You know what? Uh, I, I see that people, they're not happy. They're not happy <laughs> that it's going to be eight years out before it gets done. Of course, they're not happy, but they're more accepting of it. If they see that you have a plan and, and why it's going to be eight years out, it, it's way easier to swallow if you can see that there is a plan and that it, it will be coming. Um, it's always hard, though. Of course, is it's it, always hard. Is it hard to say no to people in your position? Because I can imagine that you want to please everyone. You want to make everyone's issues go away. But the realities are you just can't. And it's just the truth, the truth of the reality. Is it? Is it? To, do you have to say no? Or do you say, let's look into that together and potentially come up with a solution that can help you? What is what is the path forward when someone comes to you when they have an idea or a, a a thing that they want to see the village do, but you know in reality it just it it's unrealistic. Yeah, you know what? It's I, I can it's, imagine. I'm gonna I'm gonna say this because this is the thing that I hear all the time. My village needs a pool. My village needs an indoor pool that we can swim in 24 7, seven days a week, 365. Well, those cost about $60 million. And I'm assuming your village cannot afford $60 million today if they were able to go build a pool. Yeah. Yeah. Funny you mention that because uh, <laughs> the example I'll use, we just did, like, we have a beer. Uh, Fruitvale is part of the Beaver Valley. Beaver Creek runs through and there's yeah. Fruitvale, Montrose and Area A of our regional district. And we we work together on a Beaver Valley Recreation um, Commission. And we, we just did a, a survey, a Beaver Valley Recreation Survey, uh, professionally done. And there was a, lots of people said, we want a pool or we want a water park or we, we you know, and and we just said no <laughs> like we <laughs> we're paying into one we pay into one in trail which is 15 to 20 minutes drive away and it's a beautiful indoor pool with a fitness facility and everything and we pay to support that so that we don't have to do that repeat that and uh so you know, and I tell people, if you're in a city, driving 20 minutes to an aquatic center would be the norm. You can't have it in your backyard. You you know, you just can't have it in your backyard. And we'll do something else that 
isn't available in the area, but we're not building a pool. And I, I, I'm just not going to touch that 15 minute drive thing with a 10 foot pole no, because no. in Alberta and 15 minute cities is not something you mentioned a lot about. So I'm just going to move past that for a second. Yeah, just like... <laughs> um, I, I, it, 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 it it's challenging and you talk about the taxes and I want to talk about taxes because affordability is one of these key things that a lot of people are d- discussing a lot right now because we're in the midst of budgets and I, yeah. I'm assuming you're, you're still working on your budget or you've passed yes. your operating budget because you're waiting for what the requisition from the province is going to be. So that way you can yes. sort of finalize it. We are seeing tax increases of 10, 20 and Unfortunately, in one community in BC, and I'm assuming you've seen the news reports as well, 39%. That's because it's just the reality that we live in and things need to get done. Mm -hmm. Over the last few years, we've heard the phrase where we've trimmed the fat when it comes to the municipal budget. We are being fiscally responsible. At some point, though, you can only be as fiscally responsible before you start cutting back on service levels. How do you balance the the movement of the community, the growth of the community, the forward thinking of the community with the realities that the impact that you have on people's day-to-day lives is quite substantial? And people are, like you said, going paycheck to paycheck. People are very, 30% of your residents are seniors who are potentially just living on pensions right now, and they are not keeping up with inflation. Is it hard to go into a budget season when you understand the realities that you could be potentially harming someone from going to the grocery store and buying food that week to paying the water bill or paying the property taxes? You know what? Um, Yeah, that's that's always in in forefront. I'm thinking about people that are scraping by to pay their taxes but having said that, we have to provide the services. Yeah, like people, you know, people are going to be a lot more upset if if the sewer pipe collapses and they they can't they can't flush your toilet for two weeks while we madly scramble and it costs us twice as much to fix it because it's an emergency. So we're um, and also. Uh, you know, I've heard all about the community that's raising 39, raising the taxes 39%. And we all, we all are, are nearly in a position to do that. If we don't, if we don't spend money now, somebody down the road is going to be raising the taxes 30 or 40% to catch up. So thank you for we, saying that. Thank you for saying that, because as someone who has been preaching that since I've read that story, thank you, because this is what happens when you do have a 0% increase for like 20 years, things catch up with you and then you're left holding the stick. Absolutely. And what I, what I soon learned when I first got on council is that nearly every, nearly every municipality across Canada is in the same boat because most of them were largely built after the second world war and in the fifties and sixties and seventies and the pipes in the ground were new. The roads were relatively new. So let's keep the taxes down for decades. Let's keep the taxes down. Now the rubber hits the road and it's time to replace those things. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I want to flip the script a little bit because I get accused on this show a lot of only talking about negative things when it comes to communities. So I've got to ask you, what does Fruitvale get right? What is the thing that when you go to UBCM conferences, when you go talk to other municipal leaders from across your Kootenays area, Beaver County, what do you talk about and what do you say to them that you guys get right that the other communities are and be envious of you about? Well, I think, I think, well, one thing we get right is we've got a fantastic seniors program here. We, we look after our seniors as best as we can. We've got, uh, we've got monthly lunches where we get uh, between 150 to 200 seniors come out for lunch and, um, get to have a social gathering and it's they love it and it's 
it's fantastic. And it gets some seniors that are shut-ins and that get, get brought to the place. And it, it's, it's awesome. So we get that right. And um, I think we get our, like I mentioned, I mentioned again, relationships, like we, we, are good at building relationships with our neighbors, with everyone that we deal with. And because of that, we've been fantastically successful with grants. And um, in our area here, I, I, I don't know if you're aware, we have Columbia Basin Trust, which was a trust set up when, from when they built BC Hydro built dams on the Columbia River in the 60s and flooded people out and moved them out just haphazardly and and so uh in uh i think it was in the 80s uh people went to the government and said you have to compensate us somehow and now we've got columbia basin trust came out of that and they're just fantastic at uh everything we everything extra we do in the community they help us on financially That's and awesome. um yeah, they they helped us with the daycare. They put solar power on the roof of it for us. They they've helped us with the affordable housing. They help us with our parks. They they help everywhere with our community hall. Um, it's it's just a fantastic resource for us. And I tell people that I, other mayors not that I run into, I say, reach out to people and ask what there is available because there's. Right now, and I, I sooner or later the taps can dry up, but right now there's money available. Like, like I said, we got a, a daycare with no cost, really no cost to the village. We're That's getting affordable housing with very little cost to the village. And but you have to reach out for it. You, nobody comes to you and says, "Here's a check. Go do go build a daycare." I I wish they would. <laughs> <laughs> but <you> never, yeah. <laughs> um, I am cautious of time here, and I want to turn to my last subject because I think it's my it truly true truthfully it's my favorite subject because I've made a promise that if you come on my show, I come to your community. So I'm coming to Fruitvale later on this year, and awesome. I actually actually it could be in the next month or so, depending on how far I can get into the low uh, into uh, the sort of. Kootenays area before I have to turn around and drive back home yeah. to go watch the dogs. Um, so as someone who has promised to come to your community and is making that promise here on the show, what are the tourist destinations that one should see while in Fruitvale or the surrounding area? Oh, there's, there's, there's so much. There's the Ponderay river recreation area. There's champion lakes park. Uh, beautiful park that uh, I spend summer and winter up there paddle boarding in the summer and skiing in the winter. Um, there's, you know, just, just uh, half an hour or less west of us, there's Red Mountain with the downhill skiing, cross country skiing, mountain biking. Um, there's uh over in Castlegar, there's the Arrow Lakes and with uh, parks on there. There's, you know, there's just so much here. Um, there's a multitude of things to do. Golfing, there's there's a multitude of golf courses. Nine, we've got a nine hole just outside of Fruitvale, but there's there's eighteen hole courses. There's three of them. Let's see, three of them within half an hour, wow. and. Yeah. Where do you go to decompress after a long day of council meetings, after an eight o'clock start to talk about housing on a Saturday afternoon, where do you go in the community to decompress? Is there a spot that you can just go and escape it all and just not be the mayor, not be Steve, just be one with yourself and then realize that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get back up and do it again to try and make Fruitvale a better place than you left it the day before. Oh, five minutes away from my house, it's uh, the Webster Trail goes up the mountain, up through the through the woods, and it's awesome. It's peaceful, quiet, and 
You, you heard it here first, everyone. So if you're in Fruitvale, if you're looking for the mayor, go out to Webster Trail, stop him and talk to him about the housing community. I always like when I ask that question. Um, so I have one last question for you. And we started by talking about you and on the show, and we're going to end by talking about the community. And I asked you the million dollar question about duty to serve to begin. I'm asking the million dollar question to end this. In your opinion, what makes Fruitvale such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family, Steve? It's really unique as a small municipality. There's there's hundreds of beautiful small municipalities throughout this province and Canada. This one, we have health care. We have we have a doctor's office with six doctors. We have four dentists. We have we have a massage therapist. We have a chiro or a, um, a physiotherapist. We have all the health care right in little old Fruitvale. We have a, a beautiful grocery store. You don't have to leave Fruitvale. You can you can Did you just you say you have six doctors for a population of two thousand people? They serve a population of five thousand. Because immediately surrounding Fruitvale oh. is area A, which is another almost 2,000, and Montrose next to us, which is a community of 900. So uh, there's oh, a understandable, 000. but that is amazing. With world, rural healthcare being on a shortage right now, the fact that you have six, and I'm not trying to like blow smoke, but you guys got it kind of made in Fruitvale. Like it seems like you guys <laughs> truly have everything. Believe me, I I know it. Like that is, it's unheard of in small communities, and that's that's what is unique about Fruitvale. And you you can come here. You've got healthcare right in town. You can you're you're close to the American border. In in two uh, two hours, you can be in Spokane, have whatever kind of services or entertainment you'd like. Um, you've got. You've got uh, two fantastic ski hills to choose from, Red Mountain, the closest, and then Whitewater, just out of Nelson. The Red Mountain's 30 minutes away, Whitewater's 45 minutes away. And uh, we've got lakes, we've got the Columbia River is fantastic for sport fishing. We've got everything here. Steve, Mayor Morissette, uh, um, Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I I always I'm all I'm always unsure about how interviews are gonna go because you never know, right? You never yeah, know what sure. you're gonna learn. And yeah. I have learned, and I am gonna be blunt, blunt here. I didn't know about Fruitvale until you were uh, yeah. randomly started following me on social media, and I went, I want to learn more about this community. So let's learn more about this community. And I am truly excited and honored that you've come on the show, but I'm truly excited to come out to visit your community now because I think you are a hidden gem in BC and I think more people should learn more about Fruitvale. Um, so thank you. And thank you for serving your community. I don't think you municipal leaders hear that enough and I think it's high time they should. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Chris, I appreciate it. It's been, it's been fun. I enjoyed it. I like talking about Fruitvale. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth interviews on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage spanning Canada, committed to keeping you well-informed and engaged on what is going on locally across this great country. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the years. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.